God created the heavens and the earth. And the Bible says the earth was without form and void, and darkness was everywhere. In the Bible, darkness is a metaphor for chaos. The Bible says God stands in himself and of himself. And he looks over the chaos, and he goes, okay, guys, here's what we are going to do. I love God because God is the only person that can stand by himself and say, hey, guys, here's what we are going to do. <laughs> only God can do that because you understand that your God is triune in nature. God the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, three, wrapped up in one. So he can stand by himself and say, hey, guys, here's what we are going to do. Only God can do that. Only God. Come on, if we catch you in a room by yourself talking about hey guys here's what we are going to do we're gonna call the popo and a clinical psychologist okay but your god is so awesome he has such sovereign swag that he can stand by himself and say hey guys here's what we are going to do and he looks over the panoply of darkness he looks over the chaos if you will and he says uh if there's ever gonna be a manifestation of something new uh, if something new is ever gonna come into fruition the first thing I must do is bring order to the chaos that is around me. If there's ever going to be the manifestation of something new and a new beginning, I must first bring order to the chaos that I am encompassed by. And hear me, isn't that what every single one of us want to do with our lives? We want to bring order to the chaos that is around us. I dare say that that is a real, innate human emotion. Whether you're spiritual or secular today, I'm almost willing to bet anything that I can name a specific area in your life. And as soon as I said that area, you would go, ooh, order has got to come to that chaos. It is a real emotion. Come on, have you ever looked at an area of your life and said, order has got to come to this chaos? And there is nothing like a new year that makes it lucidly clear that you got to bring order to the chaos around you. Come on, have you ever looked at your marriage or a relationship and said, order has got to come to this chaos? Have you ever looked at your kids and said, order has got to come to this chaos? Have you ever looked at your finances and seen that your money is funny and your change is strange and you got more bills than you got income and said order has got to come to this chaos? I'm gonna keep saying one to one of them hits you. Have you ever looked at the back seat of your car and said order has got to come to this chaos? Something just moved. Order has got to come to this chaos. Have you ever looked at your hairline or your waistline and said order? has got to come to this chaos. It is a real human emotion that cannot be denied. We want to bring order to the chaos in our life. And I love New Year's because we have excitement and we have gusto and we have passion. And isn't it funny how every year you say, Woo, this is my year to get it together. Ooh, I'm telling you, this is my year. Now, I know I said it last year, but for real though, this is my year to get it together. I'm going to get this chaos together. We say that every year, every year. Especially church people. I love us because we're real spiritual. So we, we have to make our declaration for change. We have to make it rhyme. Have you ever noticed this? It's not spiritual if it doesn't rhyme, okay? So like in 2002, God was going to do it for you. Uh, in 2003, you were going to get the victory. In 2004, God was going to give you more. In 2005, you were coming alive. In 2006, you were going to get it fixed. In 2007, it was the year of open heaven. In 2008, God was going to make you great. In 2009, you were determined to be fine. In 2010, you were destined to win. In 2011, you were going to get the open heaven you were supposed to get in 2007. <laughs> we got all kinds of rhymes, all kinds of resolutions. And I'm not saying you shouldn't have rhymes. I'm not saying you shouldn't have resolutions. But do you know why most of our resolutions fail? It's because a lot of our resolutions... A lot of our resolve to bring change in our life. Do you know what it's predicated upon? Willpower. Willpower. Err, I can do this. Err, I can fix myself. Err, I can pull myself up by my own bootstraps. How's that working for you? <laughs> How many you know willpower is not real power? There's no power in your will. You cannot bring change by yourself. One of the funniest things we have in our culture is this thing called self-help. Sometimes I just go to the aisle of the bookstore and look at self-help and just have a good laugh. 
Self-help? How can you help yourself? How does that work? Yeah, I'm trying this new thing called change. Yeah, it's, it's self-help. How does that work? Well, I just help myself get myself out of the mess that myself got myself into. <laughs> There's no change in your will. So God says, if you want another year of broken promises, then just keep relying on willpower. But if you ever want to see me do something brand new in your life, if you ever want to see the light of God's glory shine in your life, if you ever want to see God do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that you may ask or think, you got to use the same thing that was used in the book of Genesis. And God did not create the world with willpower. He created the world with word power. The power is not in your will. The power is in the word of God. Come on, somebody ought to give him some praise if you know there's power in his word. There's no power in your will. The power is in his word. Come on, it's your will that got you in the mess in the first place. It was your will that said, give me the chocolate cake and not the salad. It was your will that said, charge it. And you know you didn't have the money. God says, willpower is not real power. If you ever want to see true change, something new manifest in your life, you have to come under the word of God. Genesis is proof positive that God's word is a transforming agent that can alter your reality. That God's word can take you from chaos to cosmos. There is power in your word. That's why in his word and in your word, you got to be careful what you declare. Because come on, God created the world around him by the words that came out of his mouth. And I declare to you that you're creating the world around you by the words that come out of your mouth. Come on, you got to be careful what you declare and talk about, oh, I'll never be better than this. Oh, I'll never get out of debt. Oh, my kid will never get a breakthrough. Come on, you better start preaching to yourself and like David, encourage yourself in the Lord and start saying, you know what, this is going to be the best year I've ever had. This is going to be the year of my financial breakthrough. This is going to be the year of my divine healing. This is going to be the year where God shows up in my life. There's power in the word of God. Are you bored yet? <laughs> because I, I love that word created in Genesis because it's only used of God. And it can only be used of God because that word in its original language created is ex nihilio. And it means to create something out of nothing. God is the only one that can create something out of nothing. You do know there's a difference between making and creating. Like if you were to tell me, Robert, uh, go make a fire. I'd be like, cool, I can make a fire. I'm going to gather some wood together. Uh, I'm going to get some matches. Uh, I'll probably get some gasoline just to make it interesting. And uh, <laughs> once I get the wood and the matches and the gasoline, I'm going to light it. <laughs> once the flame goes in the air, because I saw Cast Away with Tom Hanks, I'm going to beat my chest and I'm going to say, I have made fire. <laughs> and I would be right. I made fire, I did not create it. Because if I didn't have the wood, if I didn't have the matches, if I didn't have the gasoline, I would be void and impotent to make the fire. Here's what I love about God. He doesn't make, he creates. That means God could be in Alaska inside of an igloo with a ceiling fan and air conditioning and out of nothing and from nowhere say, let there be fire and fire will show up because your God can create something out of nothing. Okay, you really missed the opportunity to get your shout on and do cartwheels up and down the aisle of Victory Church because I told you God's the only one that can create something out of nothing. And some of you have been complaining. I heard you all the way from Dallas, Texas. You've been complaining, saying it seems like nothing is happening in my life. Seems like nothing is happening with that business I started. Seems like nothing is happening with that breakthrough I've been believing God for. How many of you know when nothing is happening, that's not time for you to give up and throw in the towel that's time for you to exercise your faith and understand that your God can create something out of nothing so I'm not going to stop believing I'm not going to stop praising just because nothing is happening as a matter of fact I'm not going to wait till the battle is over I'm going to shout right now in advance before it comes to pass Woo, come on I think we need a praise break for somebody that knows how to lift up God in the midst of nothing but you're believing that as you praise him in advance something is going to happen Woo. never doubt the power or the potency of God's word because nothing is happening God can create something out of nothing Woo. that's why you look crazy when you're praising as a believer 
I mean, you're just praising the people like, what happened? Did you win the lottery? And you can look at them and say, no, nothing. Then why are you shouting like that? Because I know God and that he can create something out of nothing. Out of nothing. Hear me. How many of you know the situation in your life doesn't even have to get better for God's word to come to pass? It could get worse. Come on, I think because we watch Disney and movies, we're like, we think the situation has to get better. It doesn't have to get better. It can get worse. But if God said it, it has to come to pass. It has to come to pass. Okay, you, you don't believe me. You remember in John chapter 11, one of the most beautiful biblical examples of this. You remember John chapter 11, uh, we're introduced to a family, Mary and Martha and Lazarus. Remember them? And, and all of a sudden, Lazarus gets sick just out of the blue. He just starts coughing. <laughs> I think I got the black lung. He just starts coughing. And uh, <laughs> they don't trip about it at first. They're like, oh, he's fine. But all of a sudden, it gets worse and worse and worse. Before you know it, Lazarus can't even get out of the bed. And, and Martha, she's a little poised. She's okay. But Mary is having a panic attack. She's like, oh, what are we going to do? This is the only brother I have. It's not getting better. It's getting worse. And Martha's like, girl, stop that crying, okay? Stop that crying, all right? It's going to be okay. It's going to be all right. As a matter of fact, when Jesus comes into town, whose house does he stay at? Stays in our house. Girl, that means this whole house is covered in the presence of the Lord. It's going to be all right. It's going to be okay. Don't you stress. As a matter of fact, give me my cell phone. Give it to me. Give me my cell phone. Takes her cell phone. You know the story. Sends a text message to Jesus. Says, Jesus, the one you love, doesn't even say his name. He knows who I'm talking about. The one you love is sick. You're Jesus. Do what you do. Send. Jesus is on the other side of town preaching the gospel. As Jesus is preaching, all of a sudden, cell phone text message noise goes off. Ding, ding. Jesus is like, what I tell y'all about cell phones while I'm preaching? The disciples are like, Jesus, that's you. He's like, oh, my bad. Pulls out his cell phone, sees the text message from Martha, goes, huh, the one you love is sick. You, Jesus, do what you do. He immediately responds. He says, do not worry. This cyclone, this sickness predictive text. This sickness will not end in death. Sends it back to Martha. Martha gets the text. Girl, look who just texted me. Jesus. Look at what he said. He said this sickness will not end in death. I told you he's an on time God. Yes, he is. I mean, they start having church. You just see some of your faces right now. You are so confused. You're like, I have never read that version before in my life. <laughs> Let me just help you a little bit, okay? That's the NIV, okay? Negro International Version, okay? <laughs> they start having church. They start shouting. They start dancing off of a text message. But don't miss the tension in the text. Right after they finish dancing, Lazarus dies. <laughs> and Jesus has the nerve and the audacity to not come to the funeral, to not come to the graveside service. He walks in four days late. Talking about, how y'all doing? Y'all good? Y'all good? <laughs> They're like, no, he didn't. They're like, Jesus, I will cut you. <laughs> oh, they were so mad. They said, Jesus, if you would have been here, my brother wouldn't have died. And uh, I know we're laughing. I know we're having a good time. If you could be honest in this place today, some of you are at that exact same place where you were holding on to a word, but you're looking at a dead situation. And you feel like giving up. You feel like saying, forget this. But you got to get the same revelation that Mary and Martha got. And that is, if God said it, it has to come to pass. And I love Jesus because he walks past their tears, goes straight to that grave, preaches a three-point sermon, and says, Lazarus, come forth, and a dead man comes out of the grave. Watch this. He had to be specific with his word because you do know his word is so powerful. If he would have just gone to a graveyard and just said, come forth, every dead person in there would have been like, hold on, he talking about me, and it would have been another thriller video. But I just want to thank God that he can get the right word to you at the right time so even if that situation looks dead, you don't forget that he is the resurrection and the life and it can and will live again. Woo, somebody
Somebody ought to just shout over that situation that might look like it's dead, but you ought to prophesy and speak to it and say life will come. He is the resurrection and the life. I don't care how dark the night or when nothing is happening, often on the canvas of nothing, God creates a masterpiece of something because he can create something in the middle of nothing. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. All that was my introduction. <laughs> I wish I was lying, but I'm being so honest. <laughs> all that was my introduction. I really needed all that uh, to, to get you to this place right here. Because I want to show you through God's word and through the creation narrative that whenever God speaks something, it has to come to pass. It has to come to pass. And that he doesn't even have to give you a sign to validate it. But when he speaks it, it has to show up. So can we turn Sunday morning into Bible study just real quick? I love this as a Bible church. And I want you to look at two different passages of scripture. I first want to look at Genesis chapter 1, verses 3 through 5. Genesis 1, 3 through 5. You can look uh, in your Bible or look on the big electronic one here on the screen. And uh, Genesis 1, verses 3 through 5. It says, then God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw that the light was good. Then he separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day and the darkness night. And evening passed and morning came, marking the which day? The first day. Is that what your Bible says? It says day one, God says let there be light. And light shows up. The light is so good, God compliments himself and goes, ooh, I'm good. <laughs> so day one, we have light as a result of the word God spoke. So I just want to establish there's a light on day number one. Uno. Okay. Let's look at Genesis chapter 1, verses 16 through 19. Genesis 1, 16 through 19. It says, God made two great lights, the larger one to govern the day, that's the sun, and the smaller one to govern the night, that's the moon. He also made the stars. God set these lights in the sky to light the earth, to govern the day and night, and to separate the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. And evening passed, and morning came, marking the fourth day. Which day? Fourth day. Fourth day. Huh. So day one, he says, let there be light. And the Bible confirms there is light. So much light, he verbally retweets himself and says, I am good. But as we just read in Genesis 1, 16 through 19, he does not create the sun, the moon, or the stars until the fourth day. Okay, right about now I have to issue a warrant for your intelligent arrest. <laughs> day one, he says, let there be light. And there is light. But the sun, the moon, the stars, which are all light-giving entities, don't make a cameo appearance until day number four. Things that make you go. <laughs> so if on day one he says, let there be light, and there is light, but the sun, the moon, and the stars don't show up until day four, you have to ask yourself, what in the world is shining for three days? And the only logical explanation I could come up with is just the power that is in the word of God. His word is so powerful, he can just say, let there be light, and light will show up without a sun, without moon, without stars, just because God said so. That ought to be an encouragement for anybody who's ever received a word from God, but it doesn't look like it's coming to pass. You are not stressed. You ought to praise, because when he says it, it has to come to pass. God is so awesome. He can just say, let there be light. And light shows up. And then day four go, oh yeah, let's put a sun and some moon and some stars up there. Then I ask myself another question. I say, God, if your word is so powerful that you can say, let there be light and light shows up, then why create the sun, the moon, and the stars? Why not let just light shine as a result of the word you spoke? 
So much so that today we just look up and go, whoo, the word is bright today. Some of you get that tomorrow. Um, <laughs> why create the sun, the moon, and the stars? Well, clause B of verse 14 tells us why he created the sun, the moon, and the stars. Let's look at it as the worship team joins me. Genesis 1, verse 14, clause B. It says, let them, the sun, the moon, and the stars, be signs to mark the seasons, days, years. He says, the only reason I'm creating the sun, the moon, and the stars is because they're going to be signs to mark the seasons, days, years. 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 Join in any time. Seasons, days, years. Seasons, days, years. Seasons, days, years. Okay, let's have some fun. Let's have some fun in church. I love to have fun in church. I'm in church all the time. So let's do this. Like this side right here and all the way up to this balcony, this whole right side, my right, your left, you guys are going to be seasoned, okay? When I point at you, you got to say season like you had your coffee this morning. This whole right side right here. These two middle sections and all the way up, you guys are going to be day, okay? When I point at you, you got to say day, like you had some Red Bull today. And then this side right here, my left, your right, and all the way up, you guys are going to be year, okay? You got to say year, like you know the Dallas Cowboys should be in the Super Bowl, because that was a catch and we got robbed. I'm not bitter, I'm just saying. So, <laughs> you're going to be years, okay? So let's try it, let's try it. Here we go. That's a rough season. I know you got more than that season. Come on, let's try it. of the that you live and the way you have successful supernatural miraculous Holy Spirit filled is when you begin to understand the value and the significance of every single and the way you have the strength and the fortitude to face each is when you say God I'm going to trust you and I'm going to worship you no matter what of life that I'm in. Come on, somebody. That is a formula that will take you to a whole nother level. Come on, somebody. I'm telling you, it's in the formula. Hear me? I believe 2015 is going to be a phenomenal Oh, don't die on me now, year. <laughs> it's going to be a phenomenal year. Yeah. Only when you begin to understand the value and the significance of every single yeah. Because you do know that each yeah. that God gives you is a gift. Yeah. It is a gift. Yeah. It is a gift. Yeah. What you do with that yeah. is your gift back to God. When you have the strength to face each. It's when you say, God, I'm going to trust you no matter what of life that I'm in. It's in the formula. I love that God put this whole formula of seasons, days, years. This is actually the last creative work God did before he started creating living things. Because every living thing, from the bird to the fish to the orangutan, to you must know your it is a principle that cannot be violated you must know your season your day and your year and do you know what I found out is so hard for us especially as humans to do is to just trust God in the midst of the 
we're in. Have you noticed this? Nobody wants to trust God for the season that they're in. We're all long for another season. Have you ever noticed this about humans? We always long for a different season than we're in. Young people want to be old. I'm so sick of you telling me what to do all the time. I can't wait till I get out of this house. I'm going to do whatever I want to do. I'm going to come in whenever I want to come in. No, I'm not 13. I'm 13 and a half. <laughs> young people want to be old. Yeah. Old people want to be young. Come on, you don't see anybody saying, I'm 55 and a half. <laughs> come on, somebody. That's why plastic surgery is a billion-dollar industry. I was telling young people that I was preaching in California not too long ago, and before I told the joke, this lady's face was just <laughs> smiling already because so much surgery had been done. I'm not hating on it. Hey, do you, boo-boo. I'm just saying. <laughs> she was trying to get a season that will never come back to her. Single people, woo, can't stand that season. I'm so sick of being by myself every night, by myself every night, holding myself. Every Valentine's Day, I have to send roses to myself. I'm tired of watching The Notebook on Netflix by myself. God, I'm going to die if you don't give me a husband or a wife. Single people, married people, every minute of every day, they are right there in my face on your side of the bed. I just wish I could get me some me time. Lord, I'm going to die if you don't get rid of my husband and you don't get rid of me. Isn't it funny? And we all hate the season we're in. But just maybe, just maybe the art of living life well to say, God, I'm going to trust you no matter the season. I don't know what 2015 has in store for you. But I do know that seasons come and go, but God's word shall stand forever. I said seasons come and go, but God's word shall stand forever. And God is looking for some believers who say, God, I'm not going to put my faith and trust in the season, but I'm putting my faith and trust in you. So no matter the season, I'm still going to lift you up. No matter the season, I'm still going to give you praise. So come on, that means if it's raining, I'll praise you with an umbrella. If it's hot, I'll praise you in my swimsuit. If it's cold, I'll praise you with my jacket on. It doesn't matter what the season is I'm holding on to the thing that is the same yesterday today and forever come on are there any worshipers in here that say God I trust you no matter the season because your name is higher your name is greater come on somebody let's lift him up in this place today